All right, so you should have your table A2. Hopefully you have that thing with you or, and have that out because we're gonna, you need to play along with this because you know how to use this table. <laughs> when you look at your table A2, you're gonna notice at the very top of your screen, by the way, can you turn off one of those, one or two of those lights? Yeah, that works. Yeah. That's fine. <clears throat> Don't take a nap on me now. Not yet. Well, if, you, well, if you look at the top, we've got two different situations here. We have something that says, it, it's not negative, actually, it's, it's negative, so there's a little end there that's not on the screen, but you should see that on yours, or positive z-scores. But you're going to notice that every situation, it's shaded to the left. You see what I'm talking about? So that shading, that says that whatever value you look up, it's just going to give you the area to the left of whatever you're telling it. Does that make sense? So if, in this case, that's going to work great because I'm looking for something that's less than 1.58. If I was looking for something that was greater than, well, then that's another story. This is not going to give you this. This, this is not smarter than you are. It's not smarter than your problem is. You have to know how to manipulate this thing to get what you want out of it. This only does one thing. This gives you the areas to the left of whatever value you look up. Not you have to be okay with that. It's always to the left. That's why this is shaded to the left. And it says right here, cumulative area from the left. And from the left. So let's go ahead and see if we can do this. Should we be looking, do you think, in our negative z-scores or positive z-scores? What do you think? Positive. Yeah, definitely, because we have a positive z-score. So let's look at that positive z-score. If we're looking just at the positive z-scores here, Can you read that okay? Here's how you use it. Your z-score is always going to be one point something something. You're going to round to two decimal places because that's what your table gives you. So when you round to two decimal places, ours was 1.58. How you use your table, this will give you the one point to the tenth. This will give you the one point to the tenth or two point to the tenth. And then the hundredth value, which is like our 8 in our case, so we have 1.58, will be given by this column. So here we go, z-score is 1, where's 1 1.5? 1 1.5, that gives you the 1.5. To get the, this one says 0 .0, 0, 0, to get the 0 0.08, you're going to go 1.5, all the way over there, 1.58. If you look on your table, you should be looking at 0.9429. Was everyone able to find that? Awesome. Okay, so that's how we look up z-scores. Any z-score you can be done the same way. You, if I wanted um, 0.43, I'd go to 0.4 over to 3. That would be my z-score. What this is giving you is an area to the left of that number, to the left of that z-score. So in our case, our area, let me look it up again, 0.9429. That's 0.9429 or 94.29% of the area is to the left. That's what this is saying. And in a moment, we're going to translate that area into a probability and realize that we're talking about the same thing. Now, for the calculator, would you like to see how to do it? Yes. Okay, you sure? You ready for it? So take out your calculators. Here we go. that thing on. Do you remember how to get to the binomial distribution? If you do, it was a distribution, right? So you're going to go to your distribution button, that second, and then the VARS button, that's right here. That's going to give you your distributions. Can you read that okay? Can you read that screen? Not really, huh? Better? Yes. Right. And right up at the very top, you got yourself normal PDF and normal CDF. You're going to go to the CDF. You want a cumulative distribution. It's going to give you everything from the left over. We press enter. It says normal CDF. All you got to do is put in the left the starting Z score and the right ending Z score. So in our case, where, where are we starting? 
actually on our on our picture that you have on your paper. Yeah, technically it doesn't ever start anywhere, right? It starts at negative infinity and goes all the way up to 1.58. But we're going to put negative 10 because it's not going to make any difference after a certain point. So we put a negative 10, make sure you do negative 10. Then we put a comma. And you put the ending z-score as well. So we have our negative 10 comma. Then we're going to put our ending spot. Remember our curve was negative 10 all the way up to 1.58. So we're going to put that 1.58 in there. Close it with parentheses if you'd like. Press enter. And you get exactly what your table gave you to four decimal places. Now after that, you're a little bit more exact, right? Because you get yourself a calculator that knows how, the, how to do this table precisely to as many decimal places as it shows on your calculator screen, which is kind of cool. But in each case, you get the same number. How many people feel okay with using the table and the calculator? Good, all right. So what we've done is we figured out that this area right here, the area to the left of our z-score, like, can you read that to me again, what was it? Point nine four two nine. Point nine four two nine. Right there, that thing stands for a proportion of the area that's underneath our curve. Now, can you tell me how much area in total is under our curve? One. One total. We just took point nine four two nine as a proportion of our area. What this means is since the area is equal to one and a probability has to all equal to one. That thing is also a probability. So not only does that stand for an area, that stands for the probability. So here's what this says. The probability of randomly selecting a thermometer that has a reading of less than 1.58 is 0.9429, or 94.29%. So in other words, it, the, the, here's what the company just figured out. They said, if I go randomly select one of my thermometers, there's a 94% chance, 94.29%. 94.3% chance that if I stick it in ice water, it's going to have a reading of less than 1.58. Let me understand the interpretation. See, now we're in the business of interpreting, inter interpreting, interpreting. It's not even a word. Interpreting. Interpreting these things as well. We gotta have to know what they mean. So we'd say, all right, the probability, the area is 0.9429. Therefore, because the area in total equals 1, I know the probability of selecting a thermometer with a reading of than 1.58. degrees. Notice how I'm going back to my original statement here. is you can either put 0.9429 or you can translate that into a percentage. That's what we just figured out. By using this, we can now calculate probabilities of things that really are quite interesting. If you think about that, I mean, that's actually a lot of math going on, really, when you think about it. How many possible values are less than 1.58? Infinite. Yet we're able to calculate the probability you're going to select a value that is less than a certain thing. That's kind of cool. It's pretty cool using this information, using the fact that it's normally distributed. And a z-score, we can translate those things. Use your table or your calculator to calculate it. How do we able to follow that? Would you try a few more examples? I have a question on it. Uh, does that mean that the probability that you can select a random thermometer, that the reading is going to be off? by less than 1.58? No, what that means is that you, your readings here for a thermometer that you're dunking in ice water, that's what this company's doing right now. They're taking the same bucket of water. They're taking all their thermometers and they're dunking them in and, and reading it. Now, it should read zero, right? It should read exactly zero. Are they all going to read zero? No, because everything we make, we're not perfect. Right? We're gonna, they're going to be off a little bit. So they all should read zero. They're not all going to read zero. Some are going to read a little higher. Some of you are a little lower. But the company has realized over their vast number of years creating thermometers that the average is zero. 
the average reading. If you add up all the readings and divide by the number that you added, you're going to get zero. And the standard deviation amongst those readings, after doing the standard deviation that you know how to do, right? Right? right. We've done standard deviation, deviation here. Was one. Now, what they're asking you is this. What's the probability that I'm going to dunk a random thermometer in that bucket of water and that reading is going to be 1.58 or less than 1.58? That's what they're asking you. Does that make sense? So it's going to, okay, let's pick one random. Here's my thermometer. Dunk it in there. 94% chance it's going to read less than 1.58. Make sense? That means that when you hand this to somebody, that they're not going to get a reading 94%, you're 94% certain that they're not going to get a reading more than 1.58, that they're not going to overestimate your temperature. So that might be a useful piece of information if you're dealing with certain situations. Does that clear things up for you? You sure? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm thinking also, I mean, if we're starting not at zero, but then we would... The z-score yeah, makes everything it. zero. Yeah, I got That's it. what's so cool about the z-score, right? Because you can use a table for every situation. In, in our case, yes, it was kind of trivial to do the z-score. I just wanted to make it easy so you could see a couple things about it. Let's try a few more examples. Specifically, we'll try two of them. Let's end our day today. Okay, same question. Find the probability with the same information that a thermometer is going to have a reading less than. Oh, uh, yeah, let's do greater than. Let's try that one. Greater than. Negative 1.23 degrees. Greater than negative 1.23 degrees. Notice that when you dump uh, a, a thermometer in a in a bucket of water, you know, below freezing, below zero would be negative. So that's that's the same. Let's go through the whole process. All right. What's the first thing we should do if I give you this type of problem? What are you doing? Find the normal z score. Great z score because that's going to translate a normal distribution into a what's it called? Very good. So let's do a z score. Can you tell me what is my x in this situation? Wait, some of you said, is it 1.28 or negative 1.28? Does it matter? Yeah, absolutely. Because a negative will be to the left of zero, the positive will be to the right of zero, right? If you screw that up, if you mess your sign up, you're going to have a completely different probability. That would be off significantly. So yeah, this is negative 1.23. We would subtract the mean. How much is the mean here, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, that's kind of nice. We're dealing with this nice and easy example that has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. I'm just going through this so that when we get to the next section, you're comfortable with doing this manipulation. Yeah, are you with me on that? Okay, so negative 1.23 minus zero, of course, that's going to give you how much? And then we divide by one, it still doesn't change. So we get negative 1.23 as our z-score. What's the next thing you do after you calculate your z-score? What do you think? God, draw a picture. Hey, what number is in the middle of this picture? Zero. Where is our z-score going to lie? Notice how now we're talking about a z-score. We're not talking about the, the degree anymore. We've translated that to a z-score. Everything is translated to a z-score. That way you can use this table. So this negative 1.23, where is it at, right or left? Left. We don't have to be exact. Just go to the left of zero, put a line somewhere, and make sure you know it's a z-score of negative 1.23. Now here's the question, All right, this is kind of an important question. Are we going to shade to the left or to the right of that negative 1.23?